floating in the mud. La garganta que ansió mojar, que temo ahogar. Te amo. are the numbers floating around since the beginning of May and depending on which one you choose you can paint a very different picture of what is going on in the Toronto real estate market since the beginning of lockdown. So yes this video will give you an idea of how the Toronto real estate market fared in the first two months of lockdown but more importantly it's going to help you understand what these statistics really mean and why you need to be careful of how they are presented. So if you're watching this months or even years down the line the numbers don't really matter and they'll be outdated but the message still applies. Let's start with the tenth of a percent increase. This is the year-over-year -year change in average home price for all transactions in the greater Toronto area for all types of inventories, towns, semis, detached, and condos. So if someone asked you, how did the Toronto real estate market fare during the first full month of the lockdown, you could say pretty much flat, pretty much no effect. But this is simply not true. First off, this stat is only worth a glance in the best of times because it clumps together all types of inventory and all areas of the GTA, areas that have very different supply and demand profiles. But more importantly, you'd be taking a snapshot in time, ignoring all recent activity and the rate at which it changed. You'd be using all of the gains we've had since last year to soften the blow. This is where the minus 12% we saw in the beginning comes in. This is the month over month change in average price. Or a non-fancy way of saying it is, after the first full month of lockdown, prices are down 12%. Let me draw it out for you quickly. Here is April 2019. Here is April 2020. Here is March 2020. So we had a good run up since last year. And so now prices have fallen back down. So if you say year over year, you are comparing last April's number to April of this year. So you're comparing this number to this number. And you can say, hey, there's been no change since lockdown. But that's simply not true. Month over month, we're comparing this price up here to this price and that is a 12% drop. Usually we don't use month over month change. Why? Because we want to avoid seasonality. We want to compare the results of one period to those of a comparable period. For example, many stores see an increase in sales leading into Christmas. It would be foolish to compare those numbers to January sales. In real estate, sales are strong during the spring and during the fall. Take a look at this chart. See the pattern that repeats every year? You see sales rise into the spring, die down a little going into the summer, increase a little bit for the fall market, and then slow down once again for the winter months. You wouldn't really get an accurate comparison if you took, let's say, a summer month like August and compared it to September, the start of the fall market. Okay, so now that you have a better idea of what is going on, is it fair to say that we're basically back down to last year's prices, down 12% since the start of lockdown? Kind of, but I would argue not really. Now I know what you're thinking, typical real estate agent, he's gonna spin the numbers to minimize the damage. Okay, fair enough. I mean, how else am I supposed to afford my fancy cliche real estate agent BMW? But hear me out, this average sales price is just the dollar volume of all homes sold divided by the number of transactions. So if a certain price bracket happens to have more sales within a given month, the average price 
will skew in that direction. As an extreme example, let's say you had a city where each month 100 homes sold for 700K and 100 homes sold for $2 million. If all of a sudden during the summer months, all of the owners of the more expensive home went on vacation and decided not to list or sell any of their properties, your average price would tank. This wouldn't accurately depict prices in the city because a $2 million home, well, it would still cost $2 million. Same thing happened once the lockdown started. We saw an enormous amount of luxury properties come off the market. And because of this, the average price took a hit. I'm not saying it's the only thing that caused the price to drop, but it definitely had some bearing on it. Okay, so you have to be weary of year over year and month over month changes for the next little while. What's a girl to do? Is there anything we can use to get a good gauge of where the market is headed? In comes the MLS Home Price Index. It filters out the noise and comes up with data that reflects a typical house in a given area. No multi-million dollar mansions or tiny little shacks to skew the numbers. Each month, it spits out two measurements. The first is the index price. It uses prices from January 2005 as its base. You've most likely heard of the Consumer Price Index, very similar idea here. Currently, the MLS Price Home Index is 286. This is for all of TREB. I don't really use that number per se, I just use the percent change to supplement other stats. The other number it spits out is the benchmark price. This is what, according to the Home Price Index, a typical house should cost in the area. Okay, so after all that rambling, how did Toronto prices fare in the first full month of lockdown according to the Home Price Index? Year over year, prices are up 10%. Month over month, flat, up half a percent. So is this the final say, this number that's supposed to smooth out any outliers? Well, no, I don't think so. I think it's just another tool you can use, another part of the story. The takeaway here is don't take anybody's word at face value. Always check to see what team they're playing for. Never rely on one number. This could literally be pitched as down 12%, flat, or up 10%. Remember, Statistics don't lie, but liars use statistics. Now that you know how to take an objective look at the numbers, here are the stats for the first two full months since the lockdown started. 416 detached, 1.25 million year over year change down close to 8%. Month over month down 15%. House price index benchmark price, 1.22 million house price index year over year change up 8%. House price index month over month change up 1%. And here is May, average price of 1.42 million year over year up close to 3%, month over month up close to 14%. Take a look at that month to month price volatility. We basically crashed and come right back to where we started. This volatility is way too extreme for residential home sales, so I think that this gives some validity to the point I was making before. Price changes are being skewed by the transaction volume of lower price points. Let's finish up the stats. House price index, benchmark price 1.22 million, up 7.5% year over year. Month over month, basically flat, up a tenth of a percent. And this, I believe, is a good representation of what is currently going on. Since last year, we are still up a good amount. We haven't lost those gains. It isn't double digits because remember, we're taking out those outliers, but it's still a very respectable amount. Month over month, we are flat, no change. And this also makes intuitive sense. A lot less sales, but a lot less new listings as well. So prices are keeping steady. There's also no reason for prices to go up. We're still waiting, we're still in limbo. Using your normal average prices, you'd be telling somebody that we've gone up 14% since last month, and this is simply just not true. Let's move on to sales, or as they should be called, transactions. And this is the first problem when numbers get reported. The headlines use the word sales, and the average person glancing at these headlines instinctively thinks it means 
price. Now, common sense would dictate that if prices were down 70% in a month, there would be blood in the streets. But it still fools some people. Now, the last two months were extremes. You would probably question jumps like 60 or 70%. But if the numbers were more along the lines of 15 to 20%, it would fool a lot more people. Why not just report the price change? That's what the average person understands. That's what the average person skimming headlines wants to see. The next issue with the sales statistic is that it is always reported alone. And yes, in most times, a decline in sales is usually not a good sign. But in our current situation, sales is only one part of the supply and demand equation. Sales is the demand side, new listings coming onto the market is the supply side, and they're both down a significant amount, close to 70%. But since they are both down, prices have remained steady. And here they are together. This is a year over year percentage change. So how we did this year compared to last year, but on a week by week basis. I know that was a mouthful. So let me repeat it. How we did compared to last year, but checking the numbers week by week. The only way we're going to see prices come down is if we see an influx of supply flood the market. Currently, that is not the case. Year over year, we were down about 65% for both sales and new listings. Sales fell about 2-3% to more. In May, both are also down the same amount, 53% year over year. But we aren't out of the woods just yet. I would argue that it is a lot easier to go see a home with masks and gloves than it is for someone to list their home and have 50 people walk through it. If the reopening of the province goes smoothly and the number of reported cases plummets, it's very possible that sellers might start listing their properties, flooding the market with inventory. And lastly, let's take a look at months of inventory. This is a measure of supply and demand. At the end of the month, if no other homes came up for sale, how long would it take us to eat up the current inventory? Between four and six months is considered a balanced market. Above six is a buyer's market. It means the market's not doing too hot. There's more inventory, more choices for buyers. Below four is a seller's market where homes sell pretty quickly and inventory tightens up. Here are the numbers. This is for 416, all home types, no condos. We had a sharp increase in April from 1.4 months to three months, but it has since started to come back down, currently sitting at 2.4 months in May. Two things about months of inventory. The first is that we've been lower than four months for so long that normal for Toronto is roughly two months of inventory. You can see that in 2018 and 2019, we've been more sluggish than what we've been accustomed to in the last decade, but the months of inventory was still hovering just above two. Even though the definition of a seller's market is four months and below, it would be very notable if we saw months of inventory trend towards three and four months and hold there for a while. Long story short, just because we're under four doesn't mean that the landscape isn't drastically changing. The second thing to note is the rate of change. We had an enormous month to month jump from March to April. Very notable. Take a look at 2017, the red line. It took us three months to see an increase of a month and a half of inventory. It only took us a single month to do so in 2020. A fast increase usually brings about a reduction in price. And that makes sense because it indicates that all of a sudden there is an abundance of supply on the market. Important to also note that since we are in such strange times, the months of inventory did whipsaw back down in May. You would usually see a sustained increase over time if the market were starting to turn. That is not the case here. Ultimately, we aren't going to see clear data for a while. We are still waiting for the market to digest the numerous amount of curveballs being thrown at it. We were on the verge of having an explosive spring market. We had Roni Rona hit in March, and from that, job loss, economic turmoil, and social distancing measures. The stock market took a 30% dive, but has since made a nice recovery. There are riots in the streets. We have the CMHC saying that they expect an 18% drop in Canadian home prices. We have a mortgage approval criteria that is changing at the end of the month. And we have the supposed mortgage deferral cliff looming. So take all these things 
package it together, and it's trying to balance itself out. Some of these things like the stock market and the riots don't technically affect the real estate market, but it does affect consumer behavior. You're more likely to stay on the sidelines if there's chaos going on around you. So what are my thoughts going forward? Well, I don't make predictions, I just tell you what is currently going on, but I have no problem pushing back on the perma doom and gloomers. So here is the best way to sum it up. If you know somebody who's been looking for a home prior to this whole debacle and they're currently still looking, ask them, do they feel as they are now getting a 10% discount? The answer is no. Survey says. Then ask them about the process. Do they still have to compete against other buyers now that sales and showings are down? And the answer is, we are competing against three to five people versus the usual seven to 10. Better, but still tough. So once again, long story short, this honey badger just doesn't give a shit. Here's a house full of bees. You think the honey badger cares? It doesn't give a shit. The honey badger doesn't care. It's getting stung like a thousand times. It doesn't give a shit. It just, it's hungry. As usual, if you have any questions or wanna chat, contact information is down below. If you're an agent looking for a brokerage, we just renovated and are now hiring. Of course we are, it's a volume business. Why wouldn't we be? Contact me at that same email.